Good afternoon, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here even at the end of a long two days and before Bill Gates and Brian Monahan speak. My name is Tom Heller. I've spent most of my life as a professor here, went into the private sector with an analytics group for 10 years or so, and now I'm lucky enough to be back in some important degree to work with the Precord Institute in the Bank of America's new uh, uh, sustainable finance initiative. And I'm even luckier to have a good friend here with whom to talk, Joachim Levy, who is the CFO and managing director of, of the World Bank, uh, and previously may be known to a number of people here as the finance minister of Brazil. So lots of experience in all of these questions and uh, a real opportunity to learn from him. Um, let me say that while we always think of technology as the driving force, and certainly at Stanford, uh, it has been an extremely important driving force in thinking about energy transition. Uh, finance, in some ways, has always been at the very heart of the policy agenda, uh, all the way since the Rio summit in 1992. Uh, because there are many ways we could understand all of the efforts that we have been making over the past 26 years as um, following the lodestar of repricing assets so that the asset values we see in the market actually reflect the various external costs, the non-monetized costs, whatever you want to um, use as terminology that reflect the total impact of the various uh, uh, values that the assets add to the economy. And, and yet, while we've had this single lodestar to follow and have approached it in different ways um, over time, in, in the background, this whole effort has gone on against, against massive shifts in technology, in economics, in finance itself, following the recession, in institutions, uh, in geopolitics. And I think one of the things that would be useful to explore in this conversation is to understand how the energy transition fits together or rubs up with friction against these various other changes that are going on in the, in, in the world uh, that contextualizes uh, the energy changes. And because of the nature of these uh, uh, damages or these potential costs associated with uh, the byproducts of energy, uh, we know that these problems have to be handled in at least some coordinated way across the globe. They, they cannot be handled nation by nation. So at least in a core set of countries, we add the coordination problem to the general question of these multiple changes that are interacting with each other. So what I would like to do in, in this conversation, in, in these, these questions for Joachim, is I'd like to focus on three specific aspects of this. First, there is a new landscape of finance that is evolving ac across the world, and, and, and certainly in this country. Um, I would like to think about the relationship between public finance and private risk um, in that new landscape. Um, I would like us to think about other major changes in context. What is going on in political institutions more generally? What is happening in macroeconomics? What is happening in technology? How do those fit together? So that's a second area of work. And I think the last area, which we may get to principally through either questions or through uh, a variety of, of, of illustrations uh, in, a, in thinking about these principal changes, is that as many people have spoken and alluded to, um, we have seen a real change in geographic concentration. Because to solve the issues of managing climate risk or other sustainability risk, so much of the world's capital, innovation, 
demography has moved into the major emerging markets. And we simply cannot solve this problem without an understanding of how these problems are situated and how they're going to be defined. So let me begin um, by, by focusing Joachim's attention on this new landscape of, of finance um, in the world that is both post-recession and post-Paris, in a world in which some of the initial things we were trying to do, like have a homogeneous, serious carbon price across the world, or have international negotiations that were productive rather than paralyzed. Um, as we've moved from general questions of credibility to infrastructure, implementation has become the critical question, and that partially explains the focus on finance. So Joachim, through the world of development banking, where you are at the World Bank, um, there are other multilateral banks, national development banks that you know well. Can you describe your sense of how this landscape is changing and what the implications are? Yeah, well, good afternoon. Um, I presume most of you know what the bank, World Bank is and the different uh, say institutions that comprise the, the World Bank. We are focused mostly in developing countries. Uh, some have uh, advanced dramatically in the last 30 years, so the, the, the landscape of our membership is changed in terms of our clients. Some uh, are what you call graduating, but continue to participate uh, as a stakeholders, shareholders uh, in the institution. Uh, in, in, as uh, uh, Tom mentioned, of course, uh, the participation of the emerging markets of developing countries will be increasingly important uh, in the discussion of climate change uh, and uh, I would say stability in general in the, in the global uh, sphere. Um, a large part of the, the global growth comes from uh, emerging markets, but also we saw this morning uh, or this morning the, the slide that showed that the impact of uh, climate change is particularly dramatic uh, in uh, emerging market countries and developing countries. Um, I would say this is the reality in many of these countries even today. And, uh, 90% of the, the countries that are really fragile and vulnerable is because they either are vulnerable from the point of view of, uh, say, climate or because of, of governance of conflicts. And very often, both are, are linked because of famine and, or because of dislocations uh, and, and continuous poverty. So this discussion is very much at the heart of what we do. I think the two existential things uh, for development these days and uh, we just highlighted this in our recent uh, annual meeting in Bali, uh, are uh, climate change and, of course, knowledge, uh, human capital, how people can respond to all the differences in the, the, the workplace and the economy. One of the big changes we believe that uh, has happened, of course, is that a lot of the new uh, industry, let's call them, the, the economic activities that are the most profitable um, actually are less capital intensive. The cost of uh, capital goods, uh, the cost of capital required to unit of GDP growth has declined significantly in most advanced economies, which has created a problem in terms of what to do with uh, the savings. Um, well, of course, part of the very low interest rates today are due to the action of central banks, but it also reflects this change between the supply and demand of savings. And we believe this is a great opportunity uh, to uh, find a meaningful, um, let's say, um, oppor investment opportunities in developing countries where you can, through infrastructure in particular, and energy that is absolutely fundamental for uh, economic development, to have uh, long-term income streams uh, created in a very uh, diversified, uh, I'd say, geographic uh, distribution. Of course, for this, you require also what we call uh, soft infrastructure, um, conditions that make uh, investments uh, with a level of risk that are adequate. And this is the heart of our activities. And there is where we realize uh, we have increased the share of climate-related 
climate benefited uh, projects uh, in our balance sheet about a third since, uh, uh, say, 2015. It's relevant, but uh, the, the multilateral banks, the, the development banks are tiny compared with the size of the, of the overall challenge. While, like I mentioned, we do have uh, a lot of savings that need to be uh, redeployed. And uh, bring together these two uh, aspects of exactly what we're doing, trying to mobilize the resources of the private sector. And the mechanisms are many. You, of course, are, are uh, familiar with green bonds, uh, other initiatives where we, we work with the government and with the market to create uh, uh, means, vehicles for investment that are particularly targeted to, um, say, promote uh, investment that have an impact generally in the environment, but more and more into um, the, the infrastructure and uh, in, in climate change. And we work very closely with the G20, with this group of countries. Uh, next year, uh, the G20 will be in Japan, where the focus will be on what's called the quality infrastructure. And there we want to, and, and all the countries want to inject exactly uh, how you uh, invest, particularly in energy, look to forward and uh, try to bring the new technologies so that you can change uh, the, the, the price equation uh, in these countries. I think it's remarkable, and also I think this morning it was mentioned the case of, uh, of India. Five years ago, we talk, we go to India and the government will talk only about uh, coal and how coal was the way to go. And especially after President Modi, uh, we, what you have seen is uh, Prime Minister Modi, we, we, what you've seen is a clear shift to um, to solar and price wise you discover that you don't even have to give uh, subsidies for that so the focus of our activities is to bring the the, the private investors so that you can leverage our capacity we can take some risk on our balance sheet so that you have what is called the blended finance where we take some of the risk that cannot be diversified by the private sector and also work so that you get an enabling environment where you can have this, this investment. And we believe that this can have a transformation impact in, in many of these economies uh, in a way that actually increase the productivity, the potential growth of uh, uh, these economies on a sustainable way uh, and uh, bring, uh, like it said, uh, meaningful uh, income, long-term income streams to investors. Do you see, um Increasing cooperation from your standpoint as, as in a lead multi multilateral bank with um, some of the institutions, national development banks, the China Development Bank, the, the National Development Bank of Brazil, the state banks in India, who have enormous capacity in terms of their lending ability. Is that being brought into this question of blended finance where the structuring of the risks reflects the different risk absorption capacity of the different public banks as well as between the public and private banks? Well, yes, no doubt. Uh, and uh, often it's, it's uh, this, uh, this blending that works. I think in the case of Brazil, um, for instance, uh, people will not know, but in a few years, uh, we get, for instance, wind accounting to something as 15% of uh, the, the installed capacity of uh, energy uh, in Brazil. And uh, in many of these places, like here in the US, uh, there is this combination where you get the new technology and also you get a lot of new jobs created because you're investing in, in, in things that, uh, of course, you, you have to build, et cetera. So it's, it's something that ultimately is very attractive. In China, it's quite remarkable what it's been doing. Uh, done and uh, in, in the area of, of green bond and a number of incentives for, for banks uh, also to, to, to steer uh, um, or to favor uh, investment when you have two choices, one that is greener than the other, uh, how you get the price signal so that, uh, say, companies will rather pick uh, a type of investment so they know they can get uh, uh, cheaper um, let's say uh, financing, usually through an indirect way. Um, and in the case of China, for instance, uh, the central bank would uh, um, require less, uh, we reduce the cost of reserves 
for uh, banks that have a portfolio that is greener. But this is not only in, in developing uh, countries. Uh, actually, if you look, we see in the, uh, in the Netherlands, ING, uh, which is one of the leader, uh, leader biggest banks there, uh, they also, they, they, uh, they, they look into the, the, the strategy, the portfolio of some of their borrowers, and if they too see that it is sustainable, even if today's portfolio of this client is not totally green, but they see they have a credible strategy to become greener, uh, they will be glad to land in more favorable terms at the margin than to, to um, companies that think that this is not important. And I think that uh, this approach, especially when you look at banks, is important because we don't want to have greenwashing. We don't want just the companies to focus on marginal little things, but really to put in place a new way of thinking. And even if it's not immediate, but to have a really uh, a strategy to, to green uh, their overall portfolio. And I think, and maybe you could uh, discuss a little bit about this, I think a turning point about this uh, was that document put forward by the Financial Stability Board, which, was, uh, which is an institution created after the great uh, financial crisis. They bring together uh, the G20 central banks and other institutions, the World Bank, I represent the World Bank there. Um, at, about two years ago, they, they issued what's called the, the Bloomberg, uh, report about the disclosure of uh, 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 climate risks, uh, the so-called stranded asset risks of, of companies. And these as well as some um, uh, legislation, for instance, in France that requires companies to disclose how they address this risk, I think uh, it's, it's, a, it's a very important uh, step forward because it brings in the discussion to a much higher level of rigor and creates uh, language that can be really talked uh, by all participants. So I think this, perhaps even more than say, a government determined uh, carbon tax, can be a tremendous effect in uh, uh, changing uh, the direction of, uh, of uh, uh, investment and really translating the kind of information that, for instance, the IPCC, the, the report of the uh, UN and so on, have made available. You have to create these levers and, uh, and mechanisms that uh, uh, um, translate this in pricing to, to companies. So let me just go a little further with the example of China because it is so important in, in the position of uh, dealing with the world's carbon risk management, uh, and that has certainly been stressed in these discussions. But I think there are several points that Joaquim made that deserve attention. First, nearly all the finance in China is from the state banking system. Let's be clear about that. The risk associated with these investments falls onto the state. Um, that's a remarkable decision because it has raised two questions recently that are worth discussing. They entered the question of securities markets because previously all of this financing, green and brown, was done by bank lending. Now they have entered security markets and have issued a very substantial volume of green bonds issued by the same state banks as, as, those, uh, as, as we're doing the, the lending. But the securities markets bring a different tone to this overall question. And, and perhaps the most interesting issue is they have just made decisions in the last two weeks that they cannot green the bond market without greening the loan market. And so the People's Bank of China is, is now issuing what I think will have to be a trend which is trying to understand, as you suggest, the total picture of financing which is being done, both through disclosure and through incentives of the type that they are now issuing. So I think it's very important to keep our eyes on this factor. And I guess my question is, are you optimistic about the rise of various thematic special purpose vehicles, green bonds, green funds, or is it the larger portfolio and the, 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 uh, the, the, the wisdom, the productivity of its allocation where we ought to be focused over the coming years? I think these, uh, these instruments are, are gateways for, uh, for investors. There is a clear demand by investors 
and, uh, uh, and uh, the sole debt organizer market, it's important to respond to that. In Europe, for instance, there is an effort even to regulate the, uh, uh, debt so that you have consumer protection. You, the investor that put the money in something that's green, uh, it knows that uh, this is green. I think that uh, more broadly, the market can provide part of this assurance. Um, I think uh, we at, at the bank, we, we work at several levels. We have a, a partner, for instance, with a, the, one of the leading uh, asset managers in Europe to get a $2 billion uh, fund that uh, basically uh, will help, uh, uh, we invest in different banks so that they can help clients to issue uh, green bonds. So we, we are using the private sector, uh, uh, enabling um, say uh, companies in emerging markets, sometimes smaller emerging markets, that by themselves do not uh, have a way to access the market, but through this fund, uh, they they can get access to the market because the fund then issue in advanced economies uh, to really develop green uh, green bond markets in all developing countries, including small countries in Africa. This is very important. Also, the mechanisms of, uh, of a coordination, and we are considering, uh, you, you see, together with the World Bank, with the IMF, uh, we do our regular reviews of the financial sector of, of countries, uh, what's called FSAP, and we are now considering to include uh, a component to see how well their financial system uh, is equipped to deal with this new landscape and the new risks uh, related to, uh, uh, to climate change. Let me make one observation here. Uh, of course, for growing economies, transition costs, in a way, um, are easier because you have additional uh, uh, demand. This is a point that, that Tom often mentioned. I think the advances in, um, in productivity uh, allows even in the market that are not growing so much. Sometimes we, we have now uh, alternatives that are much cheaper than existing, uh, uh, say, sources of energy. And the question is how you create a regulatory environment that uh, allows finance, for instance, to bring forward this gain of, of productivity. So, for instance, you can pay for the discommissioning or for uh, compensate the incumbent that has uh, a, a dirty, actually more expensive uh, productivity. So I think part of our work in the finance side is really to work with regulators on how to, to, to really uh, use the flexibility when there are gains to be shared so that uh, we, 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 we can uh, make the transition but take care of, of uh, let's say, the dislocations. And this is very important because we have the very clear example today of trade. Trade is an example where you have a lot of gains when you have trade. But if you don't take care of those that suffer, sometimes limited but very concentrated impact of this transition, then you have people who are f left behind and you get a, a backlash. So I think more and more uh, we in the finance side, uh, we also have to look on how to use finance to smooth the transition between models. I think this is an extremely important point, and, and just to probe at it a little further, uh, many of the banks, the public banks, have a history of deep criticism from the IMF, for example, on the productivity of their allocations. Uh, there can be lots of reasons, corruption, gaming, but no one knows that better than someone who has been the finance minister in Brazil. Um, so, so there is this really interesting problem we have of trying to understand how to take these scarce public resources that are necessary to bear the risk with private actors in the system and allocate them efficiently. One of the things that I find most interesting in China, and this is for comment, is that I never hear, and I spend a lot of time in China, I never hear people talking about a climate crisis. This is all framed in terms of growth, and it's largely framed in terms of AI-based growth, in which energy is an application that will produce greater growth and efficiency, but it is not the energy position itself that Xi Jinping emphasizes or the banks push, 
It is the transformation of the economy more broadly to bring a new growth model to China. Do you see this as, as, as a rising tide or simply a part of, of uh, how life goes on in China? Let me say two things. First, yes, I think, like you mentioned, especially in expanding economies, uh, the, the opportunities of, uh, if you're investing and you're investing for the next 30 years, you better invest in something that will be sustainable and you'll be working three, uh, 30 years ahead. And this is clearly, for instance, what is thought in India, like you mentioned, in solar, wind in Brazil, in many other countries. Now, talking about uh, how to use and how to focus uh, uh, resources, I would uh, come back to uh, the question of how you put a lot of these things in the language of risk. And here here, let me mention something that is quite important. Uh, it have, uh, has been created by willing central banks the called uh, Network for Greening Financial System. And what is the idea? The idea is there really to use the, say, brain power, the capacity of central banks to really start to analyze the climate change risks in economies, in the real sector, and how the future uh, and, and in the financial sector, the stability. It's true that often we think it's stability like three or five years and maybe uh, um, climate change in five years is not so obvious. Well, first, there has been an acceleration. Second, we may not be talking only about uh, banks, but also talking about insurers, et cetera. Many of these central banks are actually the regulators of insurers. And uh, the fact that uh, you start to have a good model that can price this risk and can and see what is the impact, prudential impact on, on the financial system, I think is one of the most clever ways to really price uh, the risk and to provide the right price signals to those who finance companies and uh, through this mechanism, actually, uh, the companies themselves in their investment decisions. So I think we are getting into a new uh, phase where uh, we are moving to a much more systematic approach to analyze these risks. Uh, there are enormous complexities. We go from the new scenarios, etc., all sorts of non-linearities. But you start to get a way where, uh, in a systematic way, you can get the, the right price signals. So certainly one of the main focal points of the new SFI is going to be working with these central banks and trying to come up with the metrics and the management strategies uh, that would uh, allow them to regulate in a variety of ways uh, and, and offer modes for, for managing these risks as they do appear in the economy. Um, I, I would raise a question with you. Um, the People's Bank of China, Central Bank, the Reserve Bank of India, Central Bank, certainly in Brazil, the Central Bank, are critical actors which in some ways um, mark an institutional, a potential institutional shift. That is to say, we, have, we started off with multilateral negotiations. They had their problems. We started to shift focus onto the fiscal authorities the, to impose taxes, carbon taxes, at the local level. There has been slow, slower than desired behavior in, in that area in pushing the price up to one that affects behavior. Um, we then turn to the development banks. Now, you and I both are very interested in turning to the central banks. Is this just the latest fad? Or do you think there's really something about the central banks that ought to give us more hope than we have, or more prospect for success than we have had over the last 25 years? I think it's a, it's a process. I mean, and you know the difficulties of, uh, of initiatives and, and a global coordination from a political side. I think, like, like I said, the, the advantage of, of having uh, this in the discussion uh, in central banks is that you start to have a clear language that can translate these risks on things that can uh, uh, measure, and you start to see how this impacts the, the, the stability of financial system, and then this requires some action, that you be in the remit of these banks. These are not ways to get a backdoor a subsidy or support, no. It has to be, be fo clearly fo focused on the real risk 
that uh, you have to the financial system and then take the adequate prudential uh, uh, actions uh, there. The fact that this may have a price uh, uh, impact is only uh, 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 plus uh, because this will be the, the, the market-based uh, way to get uh, uh, financiers and companies acting uh, for, well, ultimately for our survival. We have five seconds left. I want to thank everyone, and I want to particularly thank my friend Joachim for spending this time with us. Thank you very much.